Can the whole be greater than the sum of its parts? Does the existence of consciousness mean that we have to split the world between mind and body? Does free will make sense within a naturalistic worldview? These are the questions I'm talking about with Dr. David Kelly on the 76th episode of Patterson in Pursuit. Hello, my friends. Got a really excellent conversation for you again today. I've invited Dr. David Kelly of the Atlas Society back on the show, and I intended for us to talk quite a bit about objectivist philosophy. We were going to cover several areas of thought, as you'll hear in the beginning of our conversation, but we ended up talking about one, more or less, and we went into super deep detail, and if you're interested in deep metaphysical conversation, you're going to love it. Dr. Kelly was previously on episode 61 of Patterson in Pursuit to talk about Ayn Rand's objectivism. He is the founder and chief intellectual officer at the Atlas Society. He has a long history within the academy. He's written several books, and he is part of a group of objectivists that are explicitly open-minded and willing to learn and listen to other schools of thought, which, as I learned last time I had Dr. Kelly on the show, is a rather controversial position within objectivist circles. But that's a conversation for another time. If you guys are enjoying this show and you enjoy this conversation, can you do one of three things for me? Can you leave a rating or a review on iTunes or Stitcher? Tell your friends about the show and share it around to those who are interested in a new perspective of philosophy. And if you really want to show your support, head over to patreon.com slash Steve Patterson, and you can become a financial contributor of the show. For just a dollar or two every time a show like this is released, you can help keep more episodes coming. Thanks, guys. I hope you enjoy my conversation with Dr. David Kelly. So, Dr. David Kelly, thanks so much for coming back on Patterson in Pursuit. I really enjoyed our first conversation, so I'm stoked to be able to ask you lots more difficult questions about objectivism. I'm ready. Um, I enjoyed our previous conversation as well. So what I'd like to do is cover maybe three or four big areas. I want to talk to you again about metaphysics. We were talking a lot about metaphysics last time. And one area in metaphysics in particular, which is the philosophy of mind. And then I want to ask you about some ethics, because um, I know ethics is big in objectivism, and I don't have my own ethics sorted out, so maybe you can, you can help uh, sort me straight. And then if we have time at the end, I want to get a bit into the history of the objectivist movement, because I discovered in a very uh, jarring way that apparently there's some passionate disagreement and schisms within the objectivist movement. Because when I posted our interview last time, I immediately got a bunch of people that I didn't know were following my work, never seen it before, who said, oh, I can't believe you had this imposter on the show. You might have been, might as well have been talking to Bozo the Clown. He's not a real objectivist. And so they were sharing articles with me, and I was just totally sucked down this rabbit hole of thinking, my goodness, like this is a really passionate area. So maybe we can uh, explore exactly what's going on there. <laughs> sure. <clears throat> uh, I've been down that rabbit hole uh, more than once. In fact, I don't even go near it anymore. But uh, yes, I, I can well imagine <clears throat> the kinds of things you heard. Yes. Uh, okay. So, but that's only if we get around to it. Um, and if we don't, then maybe I'll have you back on and we'll have a fun one talking about that. All but, right. Great. Okay. So I'll start with an observation and then tell me what your analysis and the objectivist analysis of this observation is. It appears to me that when we're thinking about things that exist in the world, there's at least two fundamentally different types of things. It seems like there's physical things and there's mental things. Maybe there are other types of things, but it seems like there's objects, physical tears, chairs and tables and so on. And it seems like then there's ideas about chairs and tables. And to me, I haven't been able to square these two, where I, th I think there's actually, in reality, a, a fundamental ontological separation between mind and body, between ideas and physical objects. So what is the objectivist take on that? Is reality split into at least two different realms? Is everything fundamentally physical, or is it, is it one type of stuff if it's not physical? How would you answer that? Well, I would say the objectivist view is um, it, it, it is based on the idea that existence in the sense of what's out there in the world 
so to speak, and consciousness, what's in here in your mind, including your ideas, feelings, thoughts, etc., uh, are are different. And consciousness is a unique um, is, is unique in that way. So there's yes, there's absolutely a difference between the objective world, so to speak, and the subjective world or mm-hmm. inner world, con- world of, of conscious functioning. Um, however, it's that is at a very deep level of recognizing metaphysical primaries, metaphysical axioms in objectivism. The two really fundamental axioms are existence exists and consciousness exists, mm. or I am conscious. Um, <clears throat> these are two pervasive and inescapable uh, facts. Uh, that said, however, uh, existence exists is that statement would be true even if there were no consciousness. I mean, mm. it was true before there were any conscious beings, as far as we know, assuming we're the only, uh, or, you know, he, uh, it, animals are the only conscious beings in the universe, if that's true. So, uh, and so consciousness is not pervasive in the way that existence is. And consciousness is, we, we know clearly this is, um, obvious in in at the common sense level and it's also abundantly supported by uh, biology and neurobiology uh, consciousness is a function of uh, a certain developed kind of nervous system so it's rooted in the physical mm. um, nature that we that we have but on another front and let me just uh, or we can pause here I wanted to add a thought but sure let me pause there Okay. So, so yeah, a few questions on that. So you'd say that existence is the thing that's primary and kind of universal. And that's the thing that is, and consciousness is a part of existence. It's not a necessary part, but it is a part of existence. Right? Yes. Okay. Yes. So, well, it's, it's necessary in that in, and this gets into some of the issues that you go into in your book, uh, square one. Um, it is ne- necessary in that every fact is necessary. Mm. I mean, it, if it's a fact, it, it's a fact, period. Mm. Um, uh, it, it, I, it basically goes back to the law of identity. Things are what they are, and one of the things people are is conscious. So, But still, it, it, consciousness is something that we can study and say a lot more about its nature because it, it is a biological function. Uh, whereas we can't say anything more about what existence is. The existence exists. <laughs> That's so, all you can say, really. So could we say something <laughs> like, um, we cannot imagine a universe in which there is no existence. Because right? when we're talking about a universe, there's got to be existence. But we can sort of imagine a universe in which there is no consciousness. Although even by thinking about it, maybe we're kind of interjecting our consciousness into it. So in the sense... Consciousness is necessary if it is a fact, but it's not like a necessary, it didn't have to be that way. It could be, like you said, that there is some kind of existence that isn't conscious. Oh, yes. Well, m- most things in reality are not conscious. And as far as we know from astrophysics, um, the <laughs> there are billions and billions of years when there could not have been any consciousness mm. because there were no habitable planets. Okay, so the the next question then is, does that mean that in the objectivist worldview, everything is fundamentally um, reducible to what we think of as physics or being being fundamentally physical, made up of space and matter and energy, that type of thing? Um, <clears throat> everything that exists exists in the physical realm or the realm of nature um, that is has a location in space and time and um, involves matter. Mm. Um, so in that sense, yes. In another sense, though, usually in, in the philosophy of the mind, reductionism means that it, it, it's basically the idea of reducing or getting rid of consciousness as, as a um, any kind of distinctive property by reduce, by saying it's, it, you know, con- our, our thoughts and feelings are identical with mm. certain brain processes, mm-hmm. or um, there's a school of thought called eliminativism, which says all this talk about, you know, minds, minds and 
thoughts and feelings is just folk psychology mm -hmm. and um it's like witchcraft will you know we will dispense with or <clears throat> um or it's just a, a sort of a shorthand we use uh, because we don't know enough neuro neuroscience yet to mm -hmm. um, be able to speak speak describe ourselves um in fully in those terms so objectivism disagrees with both of those um, emphatically because they have the both in both cases um even the you know the identity theory so-called that um minds minds and our, our mental states are identical with physical states mm -hmm. um it eliminates it seems to eliminate the, the um possibility that consciousness is efficacious that that mm -hmm. our thoughts and decisions are a primary cause of of our actions, um, that they aren't simply epic phenomena, um, which, of course, will, gets us pretty close to the issue of free will, mm -hmm. which we may want to come back to. But um, I, I do also want to add um, the thought I was um, had before in, in, in response to your first question. The, the idea of the mental and the physical is um, it's a little different from the objectivist concept of existence and consciousness because, it, as you said, existence includes the fact of consciousness, um, the existence of conscious states. And for, for the one thing, uh, for another thing, the way philosophy of mind usually approaches the issue, it's in a very Cartesian sense that, you know, Descartes really um, – it gave th this whole dichotomy of matter and mind, extension and consciousness, mm -hmm. um, as two different kinds of substance. That is still dominates a lot of thinking about the philosophy of mind. And I, I think, in that respect, Aristotle uh, was more. I prefer thinking of it in Aristotelian terms, which is that things in existence are organized in increasingly complex ways. So there are different levels of emergent properties that you you get from when you go from atoms to molecules to mm. um, organisms and cells and organisms um, so that life is um, one level. There's a distinction between the organic and the inorganic. And then among the organic, um, the, 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 you know, the characteristic of animals is difficult. One of the defining characteristics, in you know, in common sense terms, anyway, is that they are capable of locomotion, and beyond a certain primitive stage, um, consciousness. You know, they have detection mechanisms that are involve at least sensations. So, there are levels uh, in reality, and you can keep going on up up from the individual person to societies, economies, um, and they, although, you know, they're not in one sense nothing over and above the people who make up the societies. Still, there are properties that characterize societies as such. Now, can you um, explain the, how the mechanics of emergence works? So I have a hard time wrapping my head around the idea that different, if, if the state of the physical world is composed in a particular way, in addition to its composition, you have a new thing that comes into existence. You have a new system or a new emergent phenomena. What is the status of things that emerge? Are they not, they're not fundamentally re, uh, reducible to their to their parts? There something new literally comes into existence. Yeah, this is <clears throat> this is an issue uh, that um, has gone through cycles of debate in, in philosophy. There was in the early twentieth century. Um, it was a major topic, and um, and then in the 80s and 90s it came back. Uh, I spent a lot of time thinking about it back then, and um, what I ha what I have to say would not be um, embraced by, you know, at least some other objectivists. But the way I see it is, uh, when we say that that um, you know a whole is more than the sum of its parts. What that means when you drill down is that the whole can have properties that the parts in isolation do not have because the whole is the parts plus all their mm. interrelationships. And those inter interrelationships give rise to 
functions, properties, um, capacities that didn't exist at the level of, of, mm. of the parts. And so well, what exactly does that mean? Uh, and this is where there has been endless discussion um, and uh, about how, how you specify that exactly in, 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 you know, in, in philosophically exact terms. One key issue is whether the whole has causal powers that cannot be, that are not simply um, the sum of or reducible to the ca causal powers of the parts. For example, hmm. um, the mass of a baseball, the mass of a baseball really just is the sum of the mass of all of its atomic components. Mm -hmm. So that's an easy one. But living things, at least I would argue, living things have the capacities for um, goal-directed action and the uh, in the face of, of the alternative of perishing if they don't act and act properly to sustain themselves. In fact, that and that will... If we get to ethics, that'll be um, the, the key to the objectivist ethics. But at the level of consciousness, we we know that not only that con that consciousness exists, or to put it in my first person terms, I am conscious, but that I can make things happen in a way that um, it is is not simply a matter mm. of it's certain individual cells firing in my brain in the motor cortex and in my muscles. Mm. I make that happen. I make those neural events happen. So it's called downward causation. If you think of the you know, vertical scale as from part to whole, downward causation means that properties at the level of the whole have the power and you know affect what happens at lower levels. Okay, does that mean that the the proper the higher level properties in a literal sense come into existence well yes they um uh, they exist in as as capacities anyway talking about consciousness um it that is a capacity that is exercised it continuously during the day and even in the sense during sleep because your dreams and other uh other things are still going on um in a, a weird way but uh, so yes, the thoughts come and go, feelings come and go. The state of being conscious, though, is a constant. So what about the property? So if we say, like with the baseball example, there's no additional uh, entity that is a baseball with causal powers that we need to posit in, ex in, in addition to all the parts which compose the baseball. But with something like a conscious agent or in any of these things where you, you think the whole is greater than the sum of the parts, is there, there is, there's still a property at time two that was, had no type of existence in time one. And that's the thing I have a hard, it's, that's what it seems like. And so that's the thing I have a hard time wrapping my mind around is how is it that by a change, a simple, let's say, change in the position of atoms, if we're talking about cells giving rise to consciousness, like a, a change in the position of atoms gets you a completely new thing, which is a, a property that then has downward causal power. Um, okay, let's... We, well, let's walk through an example. First, first of all, one point about the baseball. Um, when I when I use that example, I meant the mass of mm. the baseball, that particular property. Mm. Baseball, uh, in a in a in a kind of simple sense, also has properties of the whole. I mean, for example, <laughs> you know, when a pitcher throws a curve versus a slider, it's because the stitches are held and rotated in different ways, affecting the the uh, arc of the ball. So, um, and that's something that, you know, atoms don't have stitches, molecules don't have stitches, even the horse hair hide, <laughs> per se, doesn't have stitches. But, but, uh, Only has stitches when someone puts them there and makes a baseball. So, but back to, um, back to the, the, the emergence, uh, or the, the, the origin, how these properties come about, they come about in a causally governed way, um, I mean, the tricky thing about reduction versus emergence as an issue is part of what emergentists are saying 
is that all along before the emergent thing existed, the parts of which it is composed had the capacity to combine in a certain way with the result that um, it, as the result of giving rise to a new property. Hmm. And we just don't, we can't tell that um, in, in advance or, or, you know, by, by simply working up from the bottom, we can't tell that in advance because we, we don't know what causal powers the parts have until we don't know fully until they become actual parts of a more complex whole. Mm, mm. So, but I mean, just think of, uh, you know, um, the birth of a, a child um, through uh, pregnancy, gestation. At first, it's a cell, um, obviously not conscious, and cells multiply, differentiate. At some point, a nervous system uh, differentiating into a nervous system uh, as well as all the other organs and kinds of tissues. And uh, we have, you know, it's pretty clear, I think, um, that at some point before birth, um, the nervous system has developed far enough that uh, there is some level of consciousness. Um, so it's it's like any causal process. It things things develop in accordance with the causal powers that they have in them, and um, so it's no different in in that sense. Fundamentally, it's no different from why a billiard ball or to stay with baseball, why <laughs> a batter who connects um, sends the ball in the opposite direction. So, so in addition, I think I, I think I see where you're, uh, what you're saying is that in addition, or maybe not in addition is not the right word. So is it, there are objects and things have composite parts and the parts themselves contain capacities not all of which can be um, understood. So, for example, the atoms in a baseball, all of the atoms actually themselves contain the capacity for consciousness if they were arranged in a way where you could break them down in a fundamental enough way to arrange them into a brain. So the matter, would, would that be correct to say that, that atoms contain the capacity kind of to do anything in in the universe? Um. Well, yes, in, in one sense, in a fundamental sense, atoms are the only thing in the universe. So everything, um, in 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 that sense, um, consists fundamentally of the properties of atoms, or maybe we should say subatomic particles. I mean, it, mm. science, phys, physics keeps drilling deeper, but um, whatever the whatever the elementary units are, um, the so yes, but um, that doesn't mean that you can take the laws that apply to the behavior of atoms in mm -hmm. isolation and from those laws deduce you know derive all the all the causal laws of every higher level phenomenon mm. that all the laws of biology all the laws of, of, of you know psychological function so okay, so last question on this topic is then what what is a what is the metaphysical status of a capacity to do something? Because that to me that sounds very abstract, and I would even say, in my own worldview, that is a description. That's like a mental way of talking about something. It's not actually something that exists in the object. So what what would your position be on what what is the nature of a capacity to do something? Um, well, yes, uh, you're right. When we talk about capacities, um, we we're using what um, you know, as, as you know, philosophers call uh, dispositional concepts. That is, we def like brittle. Brittle means liable to break under certain conditions. So, but what is the actual property? Well, it's the atomic crystalline structure mm. um, of glass that makes it, you know, uh, uh, brittle. Um, in the case of uh, so in the case of consciousness we I, w I would say the capacity inheres in in the nervous system in the brain um, you know we we may be able someday with with um, more knowledge uh, and greater certainty be able to pinpoint the specific areas of the brain 
that are crucial for conscious. And we know something about that already, but the uh, so but consciousness in the sense of a state, an actual state, not a disposition, but my perceptual experience that I'm having right now mm -hmm. and the thoughts that I'm having right now as I speak to you are real existence. They are produced by um, ultimately, you know, they are they are produced or and supported by the underlying um, properties of my brain. And same same would be true for anyone else. But they are not themselves neural states or material states. But the capacity when I so when we talk about capacities, like here's an example. I'm speaking English right now. So that is something that's happening right now. It's an it's an actual occurrence. Um I have the capacity to speak English. Okay? Even when I'm silent, even when I'm asleep in a way that I don't have the capacity to speak Arabic. Hmm. So for me, I like to lump, I like to lump all of these problems into a different ontological category. So I get to say things like, well, you know, capacity to speak English is a mental phenomena and the, the conscious state is a mental phenomenon. It can't be reduced to the physical world. It's not made up of the physical world. There may be a correlation, but there is an actual fundamental um, distinction there. And this is a great segue because what it also, what I, I get to cheat and do when I, when I do that is I also get to be open-ended about the existence of something like free will. It, well, if it's the case that not everything is part of the, this f seems to be physically closed causal um, system, then yeah, maybe you could have something like um, the existence of volition. That's not, that, that kind of, um, I give a special exception to things which exist in this other realm. Um, so what then, how does this tie into the objectivist position on free will? Is that kind of the reason for saying there's this unique property of consciousness is so that we get free will, we get like causality, or how do you, how do you make sense of what appears to be our capacity to influence the world based on our, our decision to do so? Well, I think the, the the fact of free will is directly observable in the uh, uh, in the uh, in the same way as the fact that you're conscious. Um, you can observe the you know the the making of choice and the um, the fact that you face alternatives and could choose either one, and that when after you've chosen one, it's still true that you could have chosen the other, and also that you, the agent, you, the person, are the are the one making that choice and making the action happen. How does that tie in with, um, now, as far as we know, other animal species, at least, do not have or show signs of the same capacity for free will. Um, there are some borderline cases in interesting research, you know, about um, uh, certain of the great apes and possibly even, you know, like dolphins, uh, maybe. Hmm. But the... Um, it, that where we, you know, the evidence is ambiguous, but I would still say in the, uh, like take a dog. Um, and in the case of, of my dog, um, the dog is still conscious and its consciousness governs its behavior. It's because it smells the food that it runs to it. It's mm. because it sees the Frisbee, uh, in the air that it runs to catch it. So consciousness is efficacious wherever it occurs, even at the, um, sensory motor, the perception action. Um, level. But what seems to be unique and uniquely relevant to the human capacity for free will is the fact that we are self-conscious, that we we have the ability to step back from the, well, first of all, we have the conceptual capacity to formulate alternatives, think about the future in conceptual terms, uh, and uh, but also that we're self-conscious, that we're aware of ourselves, and we are, in that respect, capable of self-direction at a level of, of inward control that other species don't seem to have. Hmm. Nathaniel Brandon um, had a marvelous essay. I, I, I can't remember, but I've, I'll, I'll, I can find it, and you can put it on the – when you we put up the link to this, uh, this interview um, – talking about the, the levels of inward control 
from like building classic Newtonian physics, building your balls on a table, mm -hmm. There's not much inward control. Um, once the, given their mass and position, um, and the angle at which it's another ball hits them, they're going to do what they what they have to do. With animals, um, there's goal directed action, which is or initiated from within um, and governed by um, internal biological needs. It's you know even when a plant turns its leaves to the sun, um, it's not literally the sun pushing the leaf or pulling the leaf uh, in the way, the way that the object ball hits the cue ball. It's the internal uh, dynamics of photosynthesis and on and upward and upward um, into the animal sphere and then the human sphere. It's increasingly increasing degrees of inward control. So yeah, that's how I mm. that's how I would see it. So I, I love the language of saying inward control and um, thinking about humans as agents because that accords with my experiences. It seems like I am an agent. It seems like I have inward control. But when I try to give that some theory and say, okay, well, what types of thing exists? What types of things exist in the world? Well, agents with control exist. <laughs> I have a uh, I have uh -huh. a hard time not developing something that sounds a lot like a soul. Like there are beings that are out there that can that seem to have. I, I seems like I'm a ghost in the machine, right? Like I can move my limbs, I can move the physical world in ways that it wouldn't move without my choosing it to do so. And then I th that sounds like a very like a spiritual. Um, metaphysics to say that there is such a thing as inwardness and and. I, Right now, I think that's true. I, that just from my experiences, I do think that. So, how, how do you try to to take those ideas, which have, I think, explanatory power and accord with our experiences? How do you take them and try to avoid mysticism that I think is very easy to slip into when we start talking about these things? Oh, absolutely, yes. And if that's the main accusation uh, made against this approach and, and the whole idea of free will um, by reductionists that it, you can't have free will without a Cartesian soul, that is, or a you know, Christian soul, um, a separate, literal, separate entity, mm -hmm. uh, a ghost in the machine, as you say. Um, but no, I think that's a false dichotomy. We have, um, consciousness exists. Um, I keep, I've referred to it more than once as a biological function, and in that it is a biological function, just like digestion. Um, which is also a highly complex system um, that you don't find at the level of, you know, just chemistry or atoms. But anyway, in the case of consciousness, it is it does have this unique, apparently unique property that for humans anyway, who are capable of self-awareness, it, it is private. I, I'm the only one who can introspect on my thoughts and feelings, and you're the only one who can introspect on yours. Mm. Uh, but I don't think that has to be any kind of mystery. Uh, it's you can introspect on those things because introspection is a specific function. Self-awareness is a specific capacity of the brain. Um, the, uh, of the con you know the con the conscious brain, but. I, when we talk about causality, I, I think it's better to talk about just the entity is the real causal agent. And that's true for billiard balls and atoms. You know, one, one of the key things here that I think clarifies the issue a, good, a lot is rejecting the, the Humean kind of event, event picture of causality. One event causes another. Well, but, but what is an event? It's something that happens, and something when something happens, something is doing something. Some entity is acting. So an event is just um, a stretch of time when certain entities are acting, but the causal power is with the entities. And so when we think and we choose, we're choosing as entities, as being whole beings that have minds and bodies that are have physical and conscious properties and uh, doing things. So on the objectivist view, this was Ayn Rand's, uh, one of her great insights, I think. Um, the essence of free will is the ability to focus your mind. And that is an inner, and that's, that's why it, I think free will is tied to um, self-awareness, because focusing or 
dropping, lowering your level of attention or ev evading, pushing something out of your attention um, is definitely involves the, you know, um, self-awareness. So in that sense, it is an inward process, but I don't think it has to be thought of as a process um, conducted by a separate entity inside our heads, mm. you know, a Cartesian soul. So would you accept a abbreviated um, version of history that goes something like this, that maybe a billion years ago, let's say, or two billion or whatever, um, all that existed are kind of fundamental physical elementary particles. And there was no internal causality. It was all particles being pushed around. And then over time, we fast forward a little bit, you have, in addition to particles being pushed around from external causes, you have just by virtue of the fact that the way uh, that the system was pushed around, in other words, this, the position of uh, matter and energy in, in space, you get a new type of causality, which is inward causality, controlled causality, mental causality. You get entities that then have the power themselves to cause other external objects to move. So is that, would, is that like an, a, a, would that be an, a, an abbreviated version of history that you would say, yes, that's, that's kind of what happened? Um, yes, I, that, I think that's, a, <clears throat> that's an excellent summary. Um, and um, dead on. I, I would just add to clarify maybe one, one piece of it that even at the when there were just you know the basic particles, hydrogen, helium, uh, and you know the, the simpler elements, they still existed as entities, and it was the entities acting. Um, they, you know, they might have been, you know, 100% reacting, but it, they were reacting because of the natures that they had as entities, the identities. Um, so that's that's the fundamental that's true of all causality. I would I would argue, mm. but the, there are then um, different levels of causality. Like you know, I was the idea I was attributing to Nathaniel that um, uh, certain kinds anyway of of increasingly complex entities, animals, um, have um, uh, well plant or organisms and then animals and then humans have. Um, Increase this increasingly inward causality defined by purposiveness, consciousness, and in our case, free will. Mm. So yeah, not to beat the horse quite to death. <laughs> uh, causation is always entity causation, but entities differ, and that allows for different modes of causality among different kinds of entities. Mm. So uh, how would you how would you deal with somebody who said that what an entity is, if we're talking about objects, an entity is fundamentally a concept that we put around non-entities in, in the universe. So, for example, if we're talking about like a, like a toy robot, it's not itself an entity. When we use the word toy robot, we are putting conceptual boundaries around a bunch of stuff uh, that has that is only being reacted upon. So is that, I don't, I, and I, this is my belief, I don't think that there are such things as toy robots in the world per se, as much as there is just fundamental bits of matter that are put in space in such a way that we reference as toy robots. Well, yeah, that gets us into um, the issue of concepts and concept formation. But let me just make sh sure, I don't think you're saying that, I mean, well, Without consciousness, there wouldn't be any toy robots because <laughs> <laughs> they're, art, they're artifacts, artificial. But leave that aside. Uh, the robot, the toy robot, is what it is. And, and so um, each individual one, anyway, um, the concepts of toy and robot, of course, are, are concepts. So, and there's a degree of, of mental processing in forming those concepts and then applying them. But I wouldn't say that um, it's uh, arbitrary it, uh, along anything like the lines of, you know, the nominalists in, in on, on the issue of universals. Um, the, we form concepts, again, you know, I'm summarizing the objectives 
of you here, but it's also mine, which I've written about. We form concepts um, based on real existing similarities and differences among things. And we have lots of choices about how we, you know, carve nature at, at its joints, so to speak, how we, you know, draw those lines um, to in, in, in a ef cognitively efficient way for us. Mm. Um, but but it is grounded in in the real specific concrete similarities and differences. I, I do want to get this because this is a good segue into talking about free will. But I do want to just um, say one more thing on that, that I, I so this is one of the things that I talked a little bit about in square one about, like you said, things are the way they are. That is certainly true of everything. But what makes a thing, what unifies a bunch of stuff into an object, I think, that's what the mind does. So I totally would support the idea that bits of matter in space that are positioned and structured in a particular way are the way they are. And they are there, and if there were no minds, they would be there. There would still be that kind of structure. But the unification of those things into one object is what the mind is, is kind of the defining feature of what the mind does is to take many things and then treat them as as if they're one object. So in that sense, I think in my in the way that I would look at it, the toy robot kind of would not um, wouldn't exist without consciousness, but the bits of matter which are there in space would definitely exist without consciousness. What do you think about that? Well, I think that's that's true um, in the case of the robot because it's an artifact. So, But let's take a natural uh, object. Um, uh, let's say a, uh, a tree. So the tree's there, and I'm talking about a particular tree, the one growing uh, in my yard. And there, there are two questions about combining here that I, I think. One is the parts of that particular tree, the components, are combined into a rather large and complicated living organism. That's what we were talking about before. Mm. Um, then I have the concept of tree, which allows me to classify that particular tree in my yard with all the other trees there are, um, the ones in your yard, the ones in, you know, um, the Black Forest, etc. So, and, and that is a mental act. I mean, the concepts don't exist apart from human cognizers or any... I mean, humans are the only ones we know who can definitely um, form concepts. So I'm not sure which kind of combination, the internal material composition uh, of a particular thing or the mental combination of similar objects into a concept or kind. I think a tree is, is like a toy robot. I think a tree is a way of talking about uh, a bunch of stuff that's in space and that stuff changes in a particular way that we see kind of regularities in the pattern of the bits of stuff that are out there. And I, th I think it's the same thing. Now, if, because I get to cheat, I get to say, if, if we talk about conscious things, then we do indeed have some, some kind of mind independent existence. So if we're talking about David Kelly, then I think it's the case if, if there were no, uh, no minds, let's say, no, no conceptual schemes, then your the contents of your awareness might still be around. Your consciousness might still be around. But I don't think I'm putting boundaries around something and calling it David Kelly. I think you actually have some kind of existence, but I don't get to do that because I say, oh, you're a separate type of thing. You're the you're the ghost in the machine. That's what I'm talking about when I'm talking about David Kelly. But I don't I don't think trees are that way. I don't see why we would say that they're fundamentally different than a toy robot that acts a certain way when it's when it's wound up well the, the problem is, is this gets us into the whole idea of categories um you know this another one of aristotle's uh, great ideas there are certain categories that seem to be really fundamental and i um i um would say those categories are entities i.e things properties attributes qualities whatever you want to call them actions and relationships mm. and that <clears throat> that's all the exist existence you know fall into those categories one one or the other or and sometimes you know complexly but the point you know when i was saying earlier that entities um it, it is entities that cause their actions an analogous point is entities have their properties you can't have 
say a red color without something that is red and the so you can see, when you set, talk about drawing boundaries around the the bunch of matter that makes up the tree and and that but that's your boundary well at some point when you get down to the atomic level or the chemical level or whatever at some point you're just going to have to say okay this the stuff you could you kept using the phrase stuff well stuff is entities hmm. and so entities have a primacy um this this is one way in which um, objectivism is a fundamentally aristotelian uh, kind of philosophy um certainly in metaphysics and because you can't be properties or actions or relationships without entities that um, have the property, perform the action, or in, are related. So when we get up to the level of trees, um, yes, in one sense, every leaf on that tree is an entity. Um, every branch and limb is an entity. Every root is an entity. The tree is an entity. And going back to the whole idea of emergence, the, the tree really does have its own status as an entity because there are things that it does. It lives and dies. How is, how is living and dying different than the position of, of atoms changing? Well, because living means continuing to initiate action. In the case of a tree, you know, drawing nutrients from the soil, um, growing leaves, Having and having the leaves engage in photosynthesis, I mean, all of this is chemically explainable, or you know, well, maybe not totally yet, but um, there's no, there's no, there's no mystery here. But the tree itself is an entity to, uh, because it's it's alive. You would ask, you know, I said it's alive, and you said, well, what if it dies? Um, and <clears throat> what's the difference at the atomic level? Uh, or isn't life versus death simply mm -hmm. a matter of um, change in atomic position? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, this is partly a scientific issue, and so I don't want to speak, um, you know, out of my uh, <laughs> out of my specialty or out of the philosophical what's philosophically um, clear and answerable. But the tree, um, the example I used was that. The tree has certain properties. When it blows over in a storm, it's because and falls on your living room. Um, the damage it does is the result not of the, any one leaf or all the leaves, not mm. any one root or all the roots, but of the whole tree as a rigid, solid, extremely heavy object. <laughs> Uh, isn't all that still though reducible to change in change in atomic structure? So if you say you know if we're talking about photosynthesis or drawing nutrients from the soil or a tree blowing over and falling on a house, when we talk about the tree, it's I would I think it still works to say the bunch of stuff, the bunch of atomic units, and then we say it fell on a house is another way of saying a bunch of stuff changed position, uh, and then it you know to say it, it broke your house is to say. I think a bunch of stuff changed position where, so why do we don't even I mean, I, I like actually what you said about the, the, like the atoms being entities. I think that's actually correct. So there are, there are entities. I think there are lots and lots of entities, which are the fundamental units of, of maybe space time, but why do we need to posit entities in addition to all the fundamental stuff? If we can explain all this phenomena, just with changes in atomic position. But we can't explain it. We okay. can say um, that that when a tree falls uh, onto a house, you can say that what is happening is a large, a lar huge number of of atoms that have been joined into um, by uh, very strong bonds <clears throat> have changed position. What you can't do is start from what we know are the causal powers of atoms or even the causal powers of atoms to combine into molecules and from that deduce infer and totally explain why a tree would blow over in a hurricane mm. to touch on a, a sore topic right now uh, mm. <laughs> uh and by the way i hope you're okay <laughs> yes <laughs> you're in atlanta I, um, <laughs> yeah we well, we're in Charleston now. Um, they just had some flooding here, um, but we we spent some time in Virginia while it was while it was blowing over. So everything's good here. All right. 
we're talking about uh, Irma um, in late late September, right? Um, so yeah, um, and that's why I say this is this this is one of the, one of the things that is um, a, a piece of the whole reduction versus emergence issue, because real thorough reductionists, I, I believe, are committed to the claim that take what we know about the four fundamental forces in physics uh, that govern at the atomic level and subatomic level and the lo location and position of the atoms as atoms. And from that, you can infer everything up to cellular structure, animal behavior, conscious thought, the, the movement of in inflation, uh, inflation through an economy. Mm. I mean, that hmm. that just seems to me an outlandish article of faith for which there is zero evidence. I think I think I agree, and, and I, that, that it often leads people to eliminative materialism. They, and they, they do this, this very dogmatic t turn of reasoning where they think, okay, the way that the world is is this reductive picture, and therefore that means there is there are no other entities. So if you're talking about, or no other phenomena, so if you're talking about consciousness, if I can't reduce that to just, you know, bits of stuff moving around, that means it can't exist. I think that's a completely backwards way of, of developing me a metaphysics. But th I think there's another option here, which is to, is to be a reductivist, a reductionist, if it works, in one system. So I, I think I would be something like a physical reductionist in the sense that all physical phenomena can be fully explained by the movement and change in position of bits. But that won't get you, just that one system isn't the only thing that exists. There's also other systems like human actors. And then when you get consciousness, when you throw consciousness into the mix, that consciousness can actually change the, the position of atoms in that physical system. And then you get things like economies, which have this relationship with you know choices and behavior. And like you said, inflation, there's all kinds of other systems. But insofar as we're talking about the physical system, I don't, I think it's simpler just to say, well, there, the only entities are the simple entities. There are no, there's no complex, there's no um, composite entities outside of our putting boundaries around them. Um, well, I, the, the distinction you're drawing between purely physical systems, um, especially if you mean inanimate um, physical uh, and um, animate or at least conscious ones, I mean, that's a way of drawing the line, and I, I can't, I don't think I have a decisive reason to, or ability to refute that. <laughs> um, I, I am drawn, so I have to, I have to acknowledge that in my, my reference to the multi-leveled Aristotelian picture uh, is one that I, I, I find just fits better with so much that I know. Mm. And I, you know, I do stand by the the idea that that entities, even fairly simple entities, um, that are complex, that have internal complexity, like the tree, they are wholes that are more than the sum of their parts, in the mm. sense that we discussed earlier. Mm. And that what makes the you know the tree vulnerable to hurricane winds, which will uproot the roots and kill the tree, and possibly you know break a window or a roof is the overall structure weight and rigidity of the tree qua tree <laughs> that is mm. as, as an entity um it's it's not i wouldn't make much out of that as those properties um rigidity weight and so forth of the tree as as emergent properties because they're in in a way they're so easily explainable in, in ways that consciousness just isn't. Hmm. So that that's why, you know, as I'm thinking, I'm on my feet here. Uh, I'm, I'm thinking there's an element of, I won't call it aesthetic preference, <laughs> but <laughs> of sort of intuitive fit that um, I, I can't reduce to knock down philosophical arguments. And it may be because, you know, there are scientific issues here hmm. about the way the world is, you know, I mean, there are lots of scientific issues about the way the world is, but they, they may be um, in play here in such a way that we can't, mm -hmm. we can't decisively say philosophically uh, one way or the other. I'm, 
I want to stress though one thing you said earlier, which I totally agree with. Um, when philosophers adopt a reductionism um, a, as a kind of a priori or initial assumption, this is the way the world has to be. Mm-hmm. Right. That is so what we in objectivism call primacy of consciousness. It's, you know, I'm not going to look at the way the world is and what the facts are and what the best way to conceptualize and explain the facts. I'm going to start with an assumption right. about what the explanation has to be, and then I'll make everything fit. Exactly. I, that is, uh, there's way too much of that in philosophy, and you know, I, I absolutely agree with your point. Well, th- I think this is a uh, this is a great note to end the conversation on. I think it's a, it's very, fairly beautiful because I had a list of things I wanted to talk about, and this we we talked about you know two issues, but into such detail where it was really delightful in illustrating the point. Well, many points. One, philosophy is really hard. <laughs> Two, reasonable people can disagree about these things. I mean, I imagine in terms of our outlooks on the world, we probably have fairly similar, like, total worldviews, maybe politics and economics. But on this, you know, on the, these metaphysical questions, I think you and I are totally different, totally different planets. But that's okay. Re- reasonable people <laughs> can, can disagree about this. Um, so I guess that means you're going to have to come back on the show to keep talking about other issues that we, uh, that we can talk about with objectivism. <laughs> Well, we may be on different planets, Steve, but I hope we're in the same uh, solar system. (laughs) I think so. Yes, I'd love to come back. I I enjoyed this one uh, as I did the earlier one. It's great talking with you. All right. Thanks so much. Thank you. All right. I hope you guys enjoyed that conversation at least half as much as I did. And if that's true, I know that I have created lots of value for you since I had a blast talking with Dr. Kelly today. So if that's correct, then make sure to show your love on iTunes, Stitcher, or on YouTube. And that's all I've got for you this week. I'll talk to you again soon.